Trigger warning, we will be talking about brutality to women in this video because many movies love to feature heavy amounts of brutality to women. Besties. So don't want to toot my own horn here, but a person with ADHD finishing one project, let alone two, it's an icon shit, and I don't know who's in charge of like sending me my award, but I am expecting it within three to five business days, so maybe we should plan accordingly. Yes, against all odds of me falling down a spiral of hyperfixation and making a video about it, I've actually decided instead to fall down a spiral of hyperfixation and make a video about it. Galaxy brain move, if you ask me. Speaking of galaxy brain, welcome to Dumb Down Discussions, a web series where I research things that either interest or confuse me, or sometimes both, and explain my newfound knowledge back to you in a way that's hopefully entertaining. This way you can have all sorts of new conversation topics to distract your extended family every time that they try to ask you what your plans for the future are. Let's both try to learn something together, shall we? And don't be shy if you have some sneaking suspicions that everyone else is just pretending to understand a topic. You're probably right, so drop it down below and I just may be doing the heavy lifting for you. Uh, but that's for future me to worry about. So today's topic, movie ratings. Ever wonder what takes a movie from a G to a PG? And when they say parental guidance, did they mean forever? Am I gonna be stood outside a movie theater at 84, unable to see Hotel Transylvania 43 because my parents can't exactly guide me anymore? Movie ratings across the world exist to let people know the suggested demographic for a film. Who is it appropriate to be seen by? Different countries vary in how they rate movies, but I will give a heads up that this will be a pretty US-centric view of film ratings, but I promise there's a good reason for that. Reason being that while most countries are fairly transparent with their ratings committees and the decisions made by them, the United States could be described as dodgy at best. For example, Australia. They have both a government-appointed classifications board and classifications review board showing their names, qualifications, and terms of all the board members publicly on their website. The UK has a non-government appointed ratings board with all members also listed publicly on their website. The Film and Publications Board of South Africa also listing all members of their board publicly on their website plus credentials. The US Ratings Board, hmm, not listed publicly anywhere. Does that leave a bad taste in anyone else's mouth or is it just me? In order to understand the U.S. rating system, let's look at its anything but humble beginnings. It all started in 1968 when the Motion Picture Association announced this quote-unquote helpful tool for parents. The MPA is a group of the top five major film studios in the United States. Paramount, Sony, 20th Century Fox, Walt Disney, and Warner Brothers, plus the new edition of Netflix. This tool was supposed to help parents deem what movies were fit for their children's eyes, a way to decide what was for the whole family versus what should stick to date night. The original rating system from 1968 to 70 went from bottom to top, G, meaning everybody come on in, M, meaning probably going to be fine but may want to do your own sleuthing, R, meaning under 16 you gotta bring an oldie, and X, meaning that not even the oldie can get you in. This was short-lived because understandably the public was a little bit confused with M, considering it stood for mature. Uh, so they cut the M, made it a GP, standing for guidance of a parent, and flipped the two letters to good old-fashioned PG in 72. They also decided to bump R and X up to 17 instead of 16. Then the 80s came around and the public was pissed. They felt like PG ratings were being handed out like party favors, and to be fair, they were, since there was such a big jump between the PG and the R. The two movies that really sparked the outrage... Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, what with the eating of the monkey brains, and two, Gremlins, with just the entirety of that deeply upsetting film. These two movies did have one thing in common. Some nobody named Steven Spielberg was involved, I think that's how you say it. Uh, I've certainly never heard of him, but he did propose a middle ground, because yeah, monkey brains are kind of annoying to look at, but R seems harsh. As for Gremlins, I think that movie should be rated U for unwatchable. So thus, in 1984, PG-13 was born. Thank you, Steve. I don't know if he's done anything since then, but I hope he's doing well. And then came the 90s, when the X got a rebrand, renamed to NC-17, which now translated to No Children 17 and Under, meaning 18, uh, which brings us to the modern day restrictions. Speaking of which, let's dive into those. First up, we got G. Come one, come all. The MPA refuses to say with their chest that it's a children's movie, but it's definitely a movie that children can see. Conflict is minimal, there may be some light arguing, but certainly no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. 
And while the movie can be somewhat frightening at times, it certainly won't scar a child for life. Some examples of the G rating are The Wizard of Oz, the original Freaky Friday before Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan came in and embodied it, Babe, and Cars 2. PG, generally regarded as pretty safe overall. Some further investigation is recommended for parents because it might have some cartoonish violence, some no-no words, some innuendos. The movie will most likely be fine, but if you never let your kids watch Spongebob growing up, you probably won't like it. There's still no drugs and there's still no banging, so I'm out. Some examples of PG are Shrek, Star Wars, Freaky Friday with Lindsay and Jamie, and Diary of a Wimpy Kid. PG-13, finally. An actual age where we don't have to guess, because you know how great we as a nation are known for our judgment skills. If you're under 13, you better have your parents on a leash with you, because the movies aren't exactly kid-friendly. But they're certainly not obscene. A movie's overall theme won't get it slapped with anything above a PG-13, like if it includes themes of death, substance abuse, the mob, Mel Gibson, you know, topics that might be upsetting to any sane person. If there's any actual drug use, a PG-13 is just about the lowest rating it's gonna get. PG-13 can have brief nudity so long as it isn't sexual and pretty extreme violence so long as there's no gore. Examples of PG-13 are Jurassic Park, Twilight, The Dark Knight, and Easy A. Rated R. If you're under 18, consider finding a cool older family member to take you, because bringing your parents sounds like a recipe for a car ride home from hell. These films have no shortage of adult themes. They can contain pretty much anything, and it's generally agreed upon that they're not made with the intention of minors seeing them. Violence, sex, drugs, gore, profanity, and nudity are encouraged to make for a night you will not soon forget. Examples of R movies include Shawshank Redemption, Bridesmaids, Get Out, and American Psycho. NC-17, The Big Bad Wolf. No one under 18 may even be within 500 miles of a theater showing this film, not even with a legal guardian. What kind of stuff makes this worse than R? According to them, it's just too much of the bad themes. And I would give you examples, but most filmmakers go back to the drawing board and make edits in search of the R rating when they're slapped with NC-17. We'll get back to why this is later, so sit tight. So, who decides what is too much and what isn't? And how do they decide that? If you're anything like me, you probably assume that there was some sort of transparent checklist that was open to the public. Some exact listings of what's allowed and how many scenes or clips or profanities will justify a rating. We've all heard the whole only one F-bomb per PG-13, so I thought maybe that applied with most ratings, things like that. But of course it's not that stupid. It must be something totally undercover and completely suspicious. Welcome to the United States of America, where everything is convoluted. The only thing that the public is told by the MPA itself is that it's an anonymous committee of 8 to 13 everyday American parents who have children within the age range that are affected by the rating system. Their justification for this anonymity is to protect them from scrutiny. Even the filmmakers themselves don't get to know the people who are in charge of determining the audiences of their films and why they've decided that way. Speaking of everyday American parents, what the fuck does that even mean? I know several American parents, all of which are very different. So what makes these parents everyday? Well, wouldn't we all like to know? And one of us was actually sneaky enough to find out. In 2006, documentary filmmaker Kirby Dick released This Film Is Not Yet Rated, a hit piece on the rating system in the U.S. filled to the brim with directors talking all sorts of shit on this nameless committee behind the curtain. So much so that Kirby decided to hire a private investigator to track these raiders down and found that most of the raiders either didn't have children or their children were far past the age of 18, calling into question, what gives? Why them? And it sounds like in response, the answer is, why not? Kirby went on to find two ex-raiders who weren't completely discouraged by the NDA they were threatened with to come clean and say that they don't even go through basic training to become a raider. They were just thrown into the theater and told to lip sync for their lives. This led to around 10 random people going around the room and exchanging glorified eye statements about their opinions that are based on nothing. If the only qualification they needed to be on the board is having kids that age and they don't even have that, what are they bringing to the table? Like, yes, girl, give us literally nothing. Why aren't they like clinical psychiatrists or experts? And while yes, this was 2006, the MPA kind of just doubled down on the rating system after this film's release. Very much gaslighting with a sort of, well, we don't see a problem with it. And they haven't been any more transparent since then. 
So I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that probably not much has changed. Also a fun fact about the movie, Netflix was a producer, and now that they've joined the MPA, that movie is conveniently not on Netflix. I wonder why. Much to think about, huh? Okay, so you may be wondering, what makes the board so bad? So what, they hide behind soundproof doors like Courage the Cowardly Dog, judging art without the backbone to say it with their chest. A lot of people are cowards. But these cowards have a lot of power, and here's why. Now back to that NC-17 rating we talked about earlier. Remember the whole it's NC-17 because we said so thing? Well, NC-17 is frequently referred to as the kiss of death for a movie's earning potential, because if you choose to go forward with that rating, you kiss your advertising budget goodbye if the studio even agrees to release it, which they typically don't. This is why it actually means back to the editing room for some cuts. And they conveniently flex these censoring muscles in some pretty interesting patterns. Before we even get to the NC-17 content itself, let's talk about the difference in treatment between the studios that you're working with. When a movie submitted to the ratings board and earns itself an NC-17, it's pretty common for the director to give the MPA a little cheeky ring, this way they know what needs to hit the chopping block. And when working with an independent company, without ties to the big studios that back the MPA, they were met with the response that they can't tell them what to cut because they're not a censorship organization. Whereas when you're working with the big guns, they tell you what to cut down to the second. Double space, 12 point, Times New Roman. It's almost like they play favorites, which is so unexpected for the film industry, isn't it? Now for the content. As of 2006, it was seen as about four times more likely for a movie to be rated NC-17 for sexual content than violence. And not just any sexual content. Two very specific types of sexual content. What is number one, you may ask? Women having a good time during sex is a big no-no for the ratings board. There were two separate circumstances outlined in the documentary that movies had to be cut during a scene in which women were, as you say, the five-quart meal being taken care of, if you know what I mean. We have Boys Don't Cry and The Cooler. Boys Don't Cry was a 1999 movie about a trans man. The Cooler was a 2003 movie about a man and a woman falling in love and yada yada whatever, not the point. Uh, in Boys Don't Cry, the character wipes his chin once he's finished going down on Chloe Sevigny's character, Lana. And in The Cooler, you can see a hint of Maria Bello's pubic hair once the dad from Shameless was done going down on her. The board said that the chin wiping and the pubes were both too much in their separate movies. If those really were their only reasons, then we have a pretty big societal disgust for the way that women's bodies naturally operate. I mean, how many times have you seen a simulated BJ and a mouth being wiped afterwards, or just male pubes slash the happy trail? But what the filmmakers are really suspicious about, both of these scenes you really don't see anything actually, just the miming of the action, you know, acting like an actor wiping their nose after their character has a nosebleed scene, doesn't actually mean they had a nosebleed, unless they're super method and just manifested a nosebleed, which would actually be more terrifying than any other horror movie could ever hope to be. But there are some pretty long shots of Chloe Sevigny and Maria Bello's faces while their characters are very apparently just having the best time. The filmmakers had a strong gut instinct that the board was uncomfortable with this rare emphasis on women's pleasure, so they found little things that happened right after as an excuse for the scene to be censored and cut shorter. They even said that the facial close-up on Lana was too long, which doesn't sound like that would make it more explicit to me. And some people may be thinking that this is reaching, but brutality to women in film, even sexually, is a really common plot device. I'm not saying that brutality can't be shown, but why are those films able to get by with an R while showing a woman's face for too long gets slapped with censorship? Maria Bello brought up a really good point in the documentary when she says that a few months before The Cooler was raided, she saw a horror movie where a naked woman was stabbed in the chest so hard that her breast implant came out and it was rated R. But a few pubes were considered too much. Like two plus two is five, this is not adding up. 2010's Blue Valentine had to work overtime to appeal the NC-17 rating brought on by Ryan Gosling, giving Michelle Williams that five-star treatment. Just another one to add the final nail to the coffin, American Psycho was originally slapped with an NC-17 that the director said she was expecting. She even put extra violence she didn't want to use in the copy sent to the MPA so that she could cut those parts when they told her that it was too much. But the NC-17 was actually for the threesome scene being too long. Not the aftermath of the threesome scene, the threesome scene. 
That movie has chainsaws slicing women down left and right, but they find the only consensual part of the film and censor it. Please deliver us from evil. <laughs> Second unacceptable sexual content? You probably already guessed it. LGBTQ plus scenes are typically rated with a harsher hand than their heterosexual counterparts. The MPA does not side with the girls and the gays. Hmm, definitely not allies. Big example of this is But I'm a Cheerleader, a 1999 rom-com starring Hollywood's resident straight gay woman, Natasha Lyonne. It's about a high school girl who's sent to a summer camp meant to heterosexualize kids after her parents accuse her of being gay. This movie outlines how great of a way this is to stop people from being gay, send them to a place with tons of other gay people their own age during the funnest time of year where they stay in close quarters with each other. Brilliant thinking. Two sexual scenes in this movie granted it an NC-17 rating before cuts were made, both of which were fully clothed and both of which were fully gay. One was between two girls and the other was Miss Russian Doll flicking the bean. Once again, female pleasure being a plague. Now, 1999, what else came out in 1999? Hmm. Oh, right, American Pie. American Pie was released in 1999. And don't get me wrong, American Pie also needed to make some cuts for that precious R. But the difference is pretty shocking. Shall I compare to thee the jerk off scenes? One was a girl fully clothed going at it. The other was a dude fucking an apple pie with his bare ass out. Editing me here, actually, I don't know if the pie was apple. It could have been blueberry or key lime. I mean, who's to say what's more explicit, considering everything's rated by opinion? Okay, so you've got an NC-17. Where do we go from here? Well, you have two options. Option one, you make those cuts. If you're working with an indie studio, guess? Um, maybe end up cutting a lot more than you need to, but you can never really be sure. Live in that limbo forever, you stupid non-corporate hippie. <laughs> Once you've made the cut, send it back to the same people who rated it the first time, because they definitely won't be biased once you've listened to their exact directions and opinions, and they for sure won't have the inner monologue along the lines of, wow, see, this is so much better now that they've made the exact artistic choices that we told them to. Uh, that board said, fucking our movie. It's our movie. Don't want to do that. You can take it to the appeals board. Another faceless committee that you can't talk directly to. You may speak with their lawyer, who runs back and forth between rooms like a carrier pigeon in order to make a case for your film. Uh oh, but there is another little catch. You're not allowed to compare it to any other movie. This makes it nearly impossible, because as I said earlier, there are no specified guidelines or checklists there is simply the context of what other movies have been rated, and you can't use that, so just perish. I don't hate it. Plus, one extra catch uh, found by the one and only Kirby Dick. The appeals board was, and may still be, made up entirely of production executives, film buyers, theater chain CEOs, and major players in the film industry. Plus, drum roll please, Two members of the clergy, one Episcopalian and one Catholic. <laughs> Very diverse, mm hmm Yeah, now is this Red Lobster? Cause something smells fishy. Because what exactly do company executives and priests know about the psyche of a child besides how to damage it forever in a variety of ways? And speaking of major players in the film industry, let's talk about the man who championed the rating system in the first place and why some people have been known to side eye him. Jack Valenti was a former right-hand man to President Lyndon B. Johnson before becoming president of the MPA. This switch up from Washington, D.C. to Hollywood makes me very uncomfortable because I think I can confidently say that those are two of the most corrupt places on Earth. Word on the street is he may even be the reason why the government has so many anti-piracy laws that lead up to $500,000 fines and five years in prison. I remember being a kid and watching those warning screens before a DVD and thinking, <laughs> aren't you guys busy with like dealing with Hurricane Katrina? You're really gonna spend your time prosecuting a 13 year old boy for making copies of Hot Tub Time Machine? Jack Valenti was the one who introduced the whole idea of the ratings board as a tool made specifically to help parents, painting the board as this guardian of morality and saying things like, if people want to see your movie, a rating won't stop them. And this was really all just in good faith, according to him. 
besides the whole no one will know about your movie thing that can prevent them from seeing it, obviously, that proves him wrong, there's also the added factor that a lot of theaters won't even show it. This lack of visibility leads an NC-17 film to exist solely in the shadows. This tells audiences that there's something morally wrong with seeing this movie. That these things are strange and bad. And of course they knew this, which is why it's actually the perfect strategy for censorship. They weren't technically saying that you couldn't release it uncensored. They were saying that if you do, you pretty much can't be successful. Check me, you suckers. And another thing a lot of child psychiatric studies call bullshit about this whole protect the children rhetoric. We don't let kids see real sex because the US is so terrified of them engaging in it, but no notes on violence. The difference between PG-13 violence and R violence in the US is usually just the gore aspect. PG-13 you can show just about as much shooting and hitting and punching and killing as you want, but you can't show the real aftermath. It glorifies the hit, but doesn't show the consequence. People see it as this macho, glamorous world of action and adventure instead of a really horrific battleground with gruesome casualties and people on the other side of those weapons. Scenes that in reality leave people with PTSD for life. This can lead to a pretty positive view of what violence means overall. But when a documentary filmmaker went to capture soldiers' everyday life during the Iraq War and the violence, the language, the overall tone of the setting, he was given an R rating initially. And isn't that interesting? They're not allowed to know anything about real life war until they're old enough to join in and their perspective has already been shaped. His argument to the appeals court was if the US doesn't like the look of war, they should maybe stop engaging in it so much. This did win him the individual case, which is very exciting and also very rare. And I think that's kind of a big deal. Violence is glorified at every turn, pro-war ever present in US films. A big reason for that being that if a film wants to feature the US military equipment, they need to send their script to the Pentagon, have an official on set with them every day to ensure that they're shown in a positive light, and allow them to view the movie before it's released, making cuts Edward Scissorhands style at every point in the process. A lot of movies haven't been made because of the Pentagon. Then, on top of that, comes the ratings board doing absolutely nothing to deter violence and giving them free reign to show whatever they want so long as they don't show the consequences. It's a tag team effort. We're loving this collab here. The Pentagon makes sure it's super flattering and the ratings board allows endless violence so long as you can't see repercussions. You heard it here first, you guys. War is exactly like Top Gun. And yet consensual sex seems to be the moral problem here. A key part of life, something that most everyone will do, something that, if shown in a positive light, gives a good example of treating partners with respect and normalizing this act between people. In conclusion, yes, if you give a woman an orgasm, you are deplorable. If you murder women with a chainsaw, you are encouraged to keep on keeping on. Keep your head up, my guy. All in all, I think my biggest problem here is the mystery. For Pete's sake, you are a ratings board for the most public industry, arguably ever. <laughs> and you don't want anyone to be able to ask you questions. You're so insecure in your judgments that the mere thought of sharing them leads you to clench your ass so hard you could crack an egg with it. Please get these people on the list for Super Weenie Hut Juniors because the girls are, as Nicki Minaj once said, scared, shook, panicking. Like, can they please just be more transparent before we give over their jobs to the mommy bloggers and let them rate all the movies? I know they would give extremely detailed analysis on Frozen 9, complete with spreadsheets, explanations, and guidebooks. They already do it for free, and I know they wouldn't be bought. If they can't take little Brinley to see it, the world is going to be hearing about that. I mean, come on. It is a little odd that a group claiming to serve the public is totally anonymous and unreachable to that public. So much so that even the raiders themselves are threatened with NDAs to prevent them from telling anyone what goes on. And I mean, that sucks, because how else are they gonna flex knowing how every movie ends before it even comes out? The raiders are the real victims here, clearly. Media culture absolutely sways the norm, and you'd be hard pressed to argue against that. And when it's communicated as morally worse to watch someone either give a woman consensual pleasure or to watch two gay people engage in consensual sex, then stabbing a woman so hard in her chest that the implant pops out, well, then I think that's a harmful direction to be swayed in. 
Because these aren't just ratings. They're stamps of approval. And when stamps of approval are awarded to violence and brutality, but not a healthy depiction of a natural human act, they're being loud and clear about what they truly find immoral here. And once again, two members of the clergy on the appeals board, just to really hammer that home, wrap it up, you guys, that's enough for me. Electric chair to that idea. This math has ended, go in peace. Anyway, thank you so much for spending a chunk of your day with me. I really do appreciate it. This has been Dumb Down Discussions, and remember, the bell doesn't dismiss you. I do. So, class dismissed. And there is no end credit scene. This isn't a Marvel movie. When I get that budget, maybe we'll talk, but only if I get to make a three-hour-long gay orgasm that's not rated above an R. Bye!